you and your beau have finally gotten engaged and you can picture, you can picture that special day, the outfits, the flowers, the cake, the music, the ambiance, all of it. But are you aware that there are evil spirits around every corner that are trying to take away your happiness? And even more than that, that all of your wedding guests just want to rip you to shreds? Okay, okay, neither of those things are true today, but back in the day, those were both wildly believed. So many of the wedding traditions that we have today are nice, sweet, and thoughtful in theory, but they came from a pretty dark place. Hey all, it's Linda. Welcome back to my channel. For today's video, we are doing another In My How It Started series. So in this series, I talk about a story where you may know the end of the story, you may know bits and pieces in the middle, but you don't actually know how it started. So I'm going to tell you all about that, and while I do that, I'm gonna slap some makeup on my face to distract myself. These videos are coming out every other Friday right now, so make sure you subscribe so you catch the next one. The next one is definitely going to be juicy. Some of these are definitely more dark than others, but this one, this one is not that dark. So today's video is gonna be a bit different. So rather than telling you one long story, I'm gonna be talking about a ton of different wedding traditions and tell you how they all started. So there's just gonna be little bits and pieces, little stories here and there, they are all, crazy. There were some things in there where I was like, I can't believe I did that at my own wedding now that I know the start of it. So buckle in, especially if you are a bride to be, a groom to be, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna want to know about all of these things. Why did we start putting the ring on the fourth finger? Why do we eat cake at a wedding? Why don't we eat cake 24 seven? Why am I not eating cake right now? I'm going to answer all of these questions and more. So pause the video now, go ahead and get on your finest wedding attire, dazzle up in a tux if you want. I am wearing a pizza t-shirt because it's white and brides wear white, right? So let's jump right into this. Okay, let's start with the piece of jewelry that starts it all. The engagement ring. One ring to rule them all. Engagement rings began in ancient Egypt with a circle symbolizing a never-ending cycle and the space inside of it as a gateway. In the year 1214, Pope Innocent III introduced a period of waiting before you could get married. So the engagement ring really came into popularity at that point as a way to symbolize that, hey, a wedding is going to happen in the future. So what about the diamond aspect of it all? Where did that come from? Well, a diamond was made popular, so some say it was by the Sicilians and others say it was by Maximilian of Austria, who believed that the stone was forged by the fires of love. They saw diamonds as this permanent thing, so it became a symbol of enduring love, of everlasting love, and that's how that became popular. So once you have that ring on your finger, it's time to pick out who are your bridesmaids going to be. You ask them this ever important question, will you be my bridesmaid? A lot of times now they're putting it in these like boxes with butterflies and shit that fly out. I don't get it. Why you just can't ask them a simple question, you moron. I'm just kidding. If you did that, that's glamorous and you are so extra. And to be honest, I applaud your creativity because I was not that creative. But... You ask them this question and immediately their thoughts go to, what kind of hideous dress am I going to have to wear? Oh, but I don't think that bridesmaids realize how important their job actually is, or rather I should say how important it was. While nowadays bridesmaids are there to support you, to party with you, to celebrate you, in early Roman times, bridesmaids were there to line up and form a sort of protective shield while the bride was walked over to the groom's village. So that's right, they were there to protect the bride, but they would all dress similarly. So that way, evil spirits that were around and about didn't know which one of them was the bride, so they didn't know who to attack. It was thought that when you were a bride that evil spirits were there to either harm you or to steal your dowry. So these bridesmaids were your first line of protection. Bridesmaids were also expected to intervene at a moment's notice if anyone tried to harm the bride. So. I think we need to go back to that. Okay, now don't get me wrong. It's great if they're planning your shower. It's great if they're gonna throw your bachelorette party, but I think that they should be ready to kick ass for you at a moment's notice too. Am I wrong on this? I mean, I don't know. I think it would be kind of great. By the way, I originally had thoughts that I was gonna do a very bridal look today and then I decided, nope. All right, so you have your bridesmaids. What about the groom? What does the groom get? So the groom gets his best man, and you need your bros to be by your side, right? To party with, to 
give you shots of Jaeger, everything like that. No, 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 no. The main duty of the best man was drastically different back in the day. The main task of the best man used to be to make sure that the bride did not escape during the ceremony. Runaway brides were common back in those days because there were so many arranged marriages that the bride would take one look into this marriage she was forced into and she'd hightail it right out of there. It was the best man's job to retrieve the bride. And at times, the best man was even tasked with kidnapping the bride. Seriously. If the bride's parents did not approve of the marriage, the best man was tasked with ensuring that the groom was able to take the bride away regardless of how her father felt. Yes, I said kidnapping. So you might think that he's called the best man because he's your best bro. He's your best brosif, your bromethius, if you will. But nope, best was added to the title because that person had to be the strongest and the most capable of the entire wedding party when using a sword or other weapon to fight off enemies and rival attackers during the ceremony. While researching this, it's becoming very apparent that weddings were less like any romantic, glorious scene that I've ever seen in a movie and a lot more like the Red Wedding from Game of Thrones. Ah! Lots of stabby and swords and poison and things like that. Swords and poison party. So now you've picked out your wedding party and it's time to say yes to the dress. You're ready for the ceremony. You have your friends at your side. They're all ready to do battle for you at any time. The music begins and here you come walking down the aisle in your flowing white gown. Now, I think that most people, myself included, thought that white gowns were just because they were a symbol of purity, of virginity, to show that the bride had not yet been deflowered, everything like that. But it goes a lot deeper than that. In ancient Rome, brides actually traditionally wore a deep yellow veil, like the color of the flame, signifying that the brides themselves were like torches, bringing light and warmth to their new husband's homes. Athenian brides used to wear long violet or light red robes that were cinched at the waist by a girdle, and the groom was later supposed to loosen the girdle to signify the loss of her virginity. Is it just me or does it seem so messed up that a lot of traditions in general refer to a woman's virginity? Like, I guess I get it because times have changed, okay? Times have changed and I know that, but can't a woman just have a party without letting the world know the status of her hymen? I don't know, maybe I'm just feeling a little bit salty because I just want women to party, okay? Now in China, during the reign of the Zhao dynasty, both brides and grooms would wear somber black robes with red trim over a visible white undergarment. Later on in the Tang Dynasty, it was fashionable for brides to wear green to their weddings and the grooms wore red. Now, some Western brides did wear white back in the day, but only if they could afford it. White clothing was seen as a luxury because it was very difficult to attain and it was very difficult to keep clean. So if you couldn't afford to keep it clean, you just didn't own it. Because of this, only the wealthiest brides would wear white. In the year 1406, English princess Philippa married Scandinavian King Eric and was the first recorded instance of a bride wearing white. She was not, obviously, the last. In 1558, Mary Queen of Scots wore white to her wedding to the future King of France, despite the fact that at the time, white was seen as a color of mourning. So that was pretty shady. It's pretty shady of Mary. A white wedding dress didn't really come into popularity until 1840 when Queen Victoria married Prince Albert. She wore a flowing gown of white and from then on a white gown sort of became the norm and that's what every bride wanted to wear. Well, that's kind of a half truth. So her dress wasn't even white. It was more of like a champagne or even kind of a blush pink, a very light pink champagne color. It just, it was beautiful but it wasn't white. Nonetheless, artists at the time painted her dress white, so that became the truth. Also, it's not like you would wear your wedding dress once and then put it away never to be worn again. It's not like you would put it in a bag in the smallest closet of your house and shove it into a corner, like somebody I know. <laughs> More often than not, women would get married in the best dress that they already owned. And then they would just alter the dress or they would dye the dress. They would do whatever they could to keep wearing that dress over and over again until it was either completely out of fashion or it couldn't even be altered anymore. 
Now, whether you choose a birdcage veil, a cathedral veil, one that's trimmed in lace, one that's nice and short, veils are still pretty common at most of today's weddings. Like so many of the other traditions that we've talked about, this one started off as a protection method also for the bride to be protected from the forces of evil. It was also thought to protect them from jealous spirits, but also to preserve their modesty. Veils were thought to confuse the devil and protect them from the evil eye. However, in other cultures, the veil was used more in arranged marriages. So you weren't supposed to see the bride before you actually married the bride. So the veil was used to kind of conceal the identity and to prevent people from being able to see each other and being like, ooh, not for me, peace out and go. Fathers would even use particularly heavy veils in order to trick the grooms into marrying their daughters that they thought were less than attractive. Thanks, Dad. In Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamium, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which was designed to look like fire, and this would cover the bride's entire body, and again, it was an attempt to scare off evil spirits. Like so many of the traditions I'm talking about here, I kind of wish that one would come back, because how amazing would it be to see a bride sauntering down the aisle with a veil that looked like fire? That would be so cool. I'm picturing a very Katniss Everdeen type vibe. You get my drift? Something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. So judging by every other tradition I've talked about, you probably think that this one was to bring good luck, ward off evil spirits, am I right? I, you're, you're half right. The tradition dates back to the Victorian era, and if all of these were worn together, they were meant to bring good fortune to the couple. Something old was worn to connect the bride to her past and to her family, but the something new signifies the bride starting her own journey and her own life outside of her family. Something borrowed was meant to be something that you borrowed from a happily married couple so that that couple's good fortune could be passed on to the new couple that was getting married. And finally, something blue was associated with being faithful. You've probably heard the term true blue. Well, this originated from the same phrase. What's interesting to me is that something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, that was not the end of the rhyme. It was supposed to be something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, a sixpence in my shoe. The bride was expected to tuck a sixpence coin in her shoe for good luck. And no official word on why that one kind of doesn't exist anymore, but I'm pretty sure that it's because dancing to the cha-cha slide with a damn coin in your shoe is very difficult. Cha-cha, real smooth. So now you're all dressed, you have on all of your accoutrement, but before you walk down the aisle, you grab your photographer so they can capture that blissful moment when your new beau sees you all dressed up for the first time. And that is so sweet, right? Well, the concept of not seeing each other before the ceremony, again, had to do with arranged marriages. We wanted to make sure that the couple couldn't see each other before the wedding because, God forbid, if they weren't attracted to each other, they would have plenty of time to escape. But nowadays, it is a rather sweet tradition of, you know, getting those happy faces. It's the first time you see each other before you'll actually get married and just, I, mean, I don't know, it's kind of cute. But even with your gorgeous dress, your Sunday best, if you will, even with your flowing veil of red fire, no bridal outfit is complete without a delicate bouquet of peonies, roses, or tulips, right? Well, in ancient Greece, brides would carry bouquets of herbs and spices, not flowers, to, you guessed it, ward off evil spirits. The bouquet was thought to have magical powers, but it was also believed to be a preventative measure against contracting the plague. So if you had these spices near your nose, that's what you were breathing in. You weren't breathing in the plague. They did not understand masks back in the day. Also, in medieval times, people didn't bathe nearly as much as they do. They didn't have access to being able to bathe as much as they do now. So the spices and very aromatic smell of their bouquet was also kind of used to hide some B.O. Honestly, and I'm not even being funny here, I kind of wish that I had known that before because while my personal bouquet of Gerbera daisies was lovely, I would have loved to carry a bouquet of just like rosemary or dill was another popular one. Just some very fragrant, beautifully green bouquet. That would have been so pretty. And I mean, I also wouldn't be mad to carry a bouquet of 11 herbs and spices. Basically, I'm just saying that I want to carry a bucket of KFC down the aisle, so don't judge me. Also, back in the day, many women would carry bunches of straight up garlic down the aisle. So I am a garlic lover and I highly support bringing this trend back. 
the music starts playing and one of the first ones down the aisle is your adorable nephew holding his wee little pillow with a ring nestled on top. Everyone awes and you're pissed at that little jerk for stealing your thunder. Where this tradition came from though, the pillow was meant to symbolize the promises of all of the dreams you've had about this very moment coming true. And the reason that you have a child carrying the actual pillow is because kids symbolize innocence, the future, and new beginnings. With so many of these traditions pointing straight to evil spirits and people trying to kidnap and hurt the bride, things like that, I have to admit this one's kind of cute. I think nowadays we understand the tradition of the father walking down the aisle. I think a lot of us know where that came from, but just in case you don't, it dates back to the time of arranged marriages where giving away the bride literally represented a transfer of ownership from the father to her new husband. Women used to even be used as collateral to settle debts or disagreements with neighboring tribes. <laughs> also, sometimes a father would even marry off his daughter to a wealthy family as a way of elevating his own status. <laughs> Everything is awful. Now the tradition still continues today, but it's mostly seen as a way of a bride honoring her father or just showing respect and love for her father. It's not so much seen as a transfer of ownership anymore. Thank God. Finally, let's talk about a tradition that has nothing to do with warding off evil spirits and let's talk about wedding rings. Historically, the bride's ring symbolized ownership. Okay, I lied a second ago. Can we go off the topic of ownership and get back to talking about evil spirits? Because I feel like I prefer that. Anyway, in early Roman, Greek, and Jewish cultures, rings were used as a collateral to pay the father of the bride. Wives wore rings with keys attached to symbolize that their new husbands owned them. Now, the one good thing that came out of this is that once brides realized how bullshit this was, the grooms also had to wear a ring and they were like, oh no, no, Mr. Groom Man, now you wear a ring and I own you. All right, it wasn't like that. Both sides wear rings, yada, yada, yada. But why are they placed on the fourth finger? This used to be because that finger was once believed to contain a specific vein that led directly to the heart. This has since been debunked by physiologists, but the tradition kind of hung around and that's why your ring is right there. So you've said I do. You've agreed to love each other through good times and bad, and now it's time to make out with church tongue in front of all your friends and family. Well, maybe a little tongue. Not porno tongue. Church tongue. Back in the day, it was customary for the priest, yes, the priest, to give a kiss of peace to the groom who would then pass it on to the bride. And this was done to bless the marriage inside the church. So I guess you can make out with the priest in a church. This is weird. Finally, you're done with everyone staring at you. You go to the reception and the DJ makes that announcement. Hey, it's time for all the single ladies to gather. It's time to toss the bouquet. If you've spent all this time putting together this beautiful bouquet, why would you suddenly toss it to the crowd? Nowadays, it's really used as a mechanism to make single women feel really bad about themselves as they gather in a circle and everyone just stares at them. In the past though, it was quite a bit raunchier than that. Couples back in the day didn't wait until their honeymoon or their wedding night to consummate the marriage. Oh no. They would get to ramen officially after saying, I do. So they would be officially married, but then they would toss the bouquet as a distraction so they could get it on while all the single ladies beat each other up over some flowers. So the bride throws her flowers and the groom tosses the bride's garter. This has sort of become a little bit irrelevant nowadays because a lot of couples just choose to not do the garter toss, but it is still done. I have to admit that this one has always skeeved me out. Like you're in front of Grandma Ethel over there and the groom is basically basically derobing the bride, taking off her garter and tossing it to his friends. Like it's freaking creepy, right? Flowers are one thing, but having all of your dude bro friends fighting over the garter that you just took off of your new bride's leg that was dangerously close to her lady parts, like that's a moment. Interestingly enough, I found two different explanations for the tradition of the garter toss. Now in one tradition, tossing the garter symbolized that the groom had made things official. Eager wedding guests would stand outside of the bedroom where the new couple was and wait for the garter to be tossed as proof. Proof. I can't. I cannot. If the garter was not thrown, a tradition known as fingering the stocking, get your minds out of the gutter, would happen. And this meant that guests would actually go into the wedding chamber and check the bride's stockings for signs that the marriage had been consummated. Seriously. 
looking for signs the marriage had been consummated. In another example, it's said that the tradition originated in England and France. Guests would try to obtain a piece of the bride's dress for good luck. This led to the bride just being nervous and anxious throughout the whole ceremony because, you know, there's a mob waiting outside to tear your dress to shreds and leave you naked in the street. I can't think of anything more terrifying than that exact thing that freaks me out real bad. I hate it. I hate every minute of it. <laughs> to pacify the crowd, but also to calm the bride down, the groom would toss out a piece of the bride's wedding attire to distract the guests as the newlyweds would make a swift escape to just get the fuck out of there. Okay, so the cake needs to be six tiers high with a different flavor on each tier and it needs to be wrapped in 24 karat gold ribbon. And then when you take the top off, doves fly out and bless the crowd. Sometimes uh, people will even go to weddings just because they know they're promised some cake. That person is me. Now I do have to say my cake was pretty amazing and it was pretty extra. I was even on the TV show Ace of Cakes season two episode one Chi Town and Wedding Gowns where we had like this big reveal of our cake in the middle of my wedding reception. Let me tell you it's a little weird to have a big camera crew there at your wedding reception but that's besides the point. Now originally at a wedding the groom would take a bite of some bread and he would crumble the rest of the bread over his bride's head as a uh, symbol of good luck. The good luck was usually in the fertility department, if we're being honest. Now the guests, yes, the same guests that probably ripped the bride's dress to shreds minutes ago would then scramble like rats at the bride's feet, snatching up pieces and crumbs of the bread to absorb some of the good luck. I just can't get this part out of my head. Like you've spent hours putting together your outfit, putting together this wedding, and you've got guests at your feet like and they've already ripped you to shred. Like, what even is this? Why did people get married? And then, and then when you're all done up, this dude who you're about to marry crumbles some nasty ass bread over your head while your guests, who you paid $24 a plate for them to be there, are scurrying around your feet like scavengers. Savage. Now later, the tradition did evolve a bit. The bride would take a piece of cake and push pieces of it through her wedding ring to her guests. The guests would take that piece of cake home with them and put it under their pillow again for good luck. I wonder how many of those guests forgot that the cake was there and then like woke up in the middle of the night and they were like, ooh, piece of cake. Now after the wedding, many couples will save the top tier of their wedding cake and they will freeze it to be eaten on the first anniversary. Saving the cake though was not always a method of celebrating the first anniversary. It was actually meant to be a celebration cake for when the bride got pregnant so you wouldn't have to buy a new cake to announce your pregnancy. This was because it was assumed that you would have a baby within a year of getting married. Because that's all we're there for ladies and gentlemen, just popping out babies. Okay, I wanna talk for a second about throwing rice. Lots of people, myself included, thought that rice was now bad to throw because birds could not digest uncooked rice and their stomachs would explode when the rice expanded. It's actually been proven now that that's not true at all. You probably still shouldn't throw rice because you don't need to litter the ground, but nonetheless, I just wanted to get that out there. But where did the whole rice tradition come from? This tradition started as a way to shower the couple with fortune, prosperity, and yes, fertility. Because you're not a real couple until you bear fruit, am I right? It's finally time to drive away from the reception. You're exhausted, you're tired, you just want to go to sleep. So you derobe, you get into bed, and you pass the hell out. Only to have every single one of your friends turn out under the window of your bedroom and bang pots and pans to wake you up, where you are then expected to arise from your slumber, get back into your wedding clothes, and start the party all over again. This was what was practiced on the American frontier well into the early 20th century. The American version really originated in France, where grooms essentially had snatched a local girl away from all these local boys in a small town, and the groom would make a peace offering by offering everyone a midnight meal. Midnight parties eventually became this thing that grooms were expected to hold and attend. Now, while the midnight parties and the banging of pots and pans eventually went out of fashion, it was replaced by the tradition of tying cans to the bumper of a car, and this was uh, just the substitution for an all-night party. So you did it, you're married, and now you get to relax by going on your honeymoon, and you're gonna go to Bali, and you're gonna sit on the beach, and you're gonna sip margaritas and frozen pina coladas all day. 
Back in the way back, remember how I said that the best man would kidnap the bride? Well, the honeymoons were the chance for the grooms to step up and do the kidnapping. It was a way for the groom to hide the new bride for about a month. Yes, a month. Who goes on a month-long honeymoon? Why did I not go on a month-long honeymoon? I'm frankly quite offended. Lucky. This was so that the bride's tribe would not be able to find her and steal her back from the clutches of the groom. Much of the time, the bride and groom would actually go into hiding, and during each of those 30 days that they were hidden, a friend or family member would bring them a cup of honey wine so that 30 days of consumption would equal a honeymoon. In the 18th century, honeymoons were less of a vacation and more of a chance to visit relatives who weren't even able to attend your wedding, so nothing says relaxation like going to visit your great aunt Edna who has never really liked you. Once you get home from the honeymoon, your new beau lifts you up gently and carries you over the threshold to the new home that you're gonna share together. This allows you to get back to your real life after your apparently month-long vacation. Yes, I'm still bitter about that. It really was customary for the groom to lift the bride and carry her over the threshold because it was considered unladylike for a daughter to want to leave her father's home. So this was almost like granting her permission to come into her new home. Also, surprise, newlyweds were thought to be highly susceptible to, you guessed it, evil spirits. Can we get a hand for evil spirits? By carrying the bride over the threshold, the groom was said to be protecting her because her feet were never able to touch the ground. I think I need to complete this look. I've got my veil, I've got my garlic and basil, I'm the prettiest bride that ever there was. Oh, this feels so weird. <laughs> So that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this video. I feel like some of these traditions are so damn weird. Like we knew about some of them. Yeah, we knew it was, you know, to protect the arranged marriages or a father giving away his bride, giving away his collateral. But I really didn't know how many people believed in evil spirits that they were around the corner at every moment trying to snatch away the bride. I'm like, oh, yeah. Again though, I really do think some of these traditions need to come back. Like I think we need some ass kicking bridesmaids. I think we need groomsmen with swords. I think we need cake and bread. I really enjoy bread. But that's it. If you enjoyed this video, I would love if you'd give it a thumbs up. That really does help out my channel. Again, these videos are coming out every other Friday right now. Some of them are a little more dark. Some of them are a little more lighthearted like this one where I get to wear a veil with my pizza shirt and feel like a very dramatic bride. You all can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Those are all glitter fallout. And as always and forever, you are super freaking rock stars. I love you so much with my whole heart and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.